Hi, I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine, and I'm here in Suffern, New York for the 2013 Northeast Astronomy Forum, better known as NEEF. And right now I'm over at the Southern Stars booth and I'm talking with Tim Benedictus, the founder and owner of Southern Stars. Uh, I think a lot of readers uh, will recognize Southern Stars as the people who manufacture Sky Safari. It is one of the best, if not the best, planetarium programs for Apple mobile devices, the iPhone, the iPad, and it is a really nice product. But Tim has got some really exciting stuff here that a lot of people have been interested in, and I want him to tell me about that first. Sure. Well, thanks, Dennis. And before I jump into that, I want to add that we're also with Sky Safari on Android. So oh, we're on yes. multiple platforms now as that's, well. That's relatively new. So exactly, exactly. And, and some of the success of that is what led to our new project, uh, which is what people have been asking us here about. The, the backstory is that in 2011, we saw the last launch of the Space Shuttle Atlantis. Our apps started to do really well at the same time. And you know, on the one hand, the manned space program is ending kind of sad. Mobile devices are going crazy, kind of cool. How can we combine these two things to keep that you know, space love alive? We decided to launch a satellite. And uh, the satellite would be using the same kind of technology that would be, was pioneered at Stanford University in the late 90s, early 2000s. And the concept is called a CubeSat. Uh, it's a 10 centimeter cube. It's piggybacked on top of an existing rocket so that you know, the university classroom is not expected to fund their own rocket launch. Rather, they can tag along with an existing satellite that already might be going into orbit. So since that time, about 100 or so of these CubeSats have been launched. And we realized by doing some research that this is not only you know, something that we could do technically, but it's also within our budget. Um, the launch cost for a satellite of this size is about $100,000. Um, well, you know, that's a lot of money for you and me, but it's not you know, NASA mission kind of money. And uh, the electronics themselves are the same kind of you know, small electronics that are in our SkyFi device, which we've had some success selling in the telescope control area. And I've actually brought with us to NEEF uh, a full scale carbon copy of the actual satellite. Let's, let's take a which, look at it. Sure. And here it is. So this is a prototype. Actually, no, this is a flight ready spare. In other words, this is an exact carbon copy of the real satellite, which is being delivered to Houston, to NASA on Monday of this week. Uh, this could fly. Um, I brought it to Neef uh, without electronics, so it's easier to get through airline security. Uh, but this is the real size of the satellite and its launch configuration. Uh, the solar panels are folded up against the side of the satellite uh, to make a very nice, neat 10 centimeter cube. Um, it'll launch to the space station, the International Space Station, on a Falcon 9 Dragon uh, capsule in December. Uh, and once it gets to the space station, it'll be unpacked by the astronauts and then deployed out of the side of the space station about two weeks after that. All right. Can you give me a big picture overview of what's going to happen with the satellite once it's in orbit, what it's going to do? Sure. Well, the real question is, what are you going to do with the satellite? And the satellite will let you do three things. One is, it'll let you take pictures from orbit. Two is, it will let you send broadcast messages from orbit. And the third thing it will do is bring itself down out of orbit in a way that makes itself optically visible. With your own eyes, you'll be able to see the satellite that you've been taking pictures and you've been sending messages from. When you say you, do you mean me as an individual or just you as in general? I mean, I mean you. I mean anyone with a smartphone, which these days is pretty much everyone. Dennis, you have a smartphone, right? I have a smartphone in my pocket, yes. OK, well then you means you. You will be able to take pictures, send messages, and watch your satellite deorbit from orbit next year. All right, give me some of the details. OK, so this satellite, after it deploys from the space station, will first unfold its solar panels. So as you'll notice, um, there's nylon threads holding the solar panels in place. 45 minutes after deployment, the satellite will cut these threads using a nichrome burn wire, the same kind of wire that's in like a hair dryer or a soldering iron. All right. The solar panels are spring-loaded. They pop down. They'll hang down under the satellite. That exposes three cameras, one on each side. It'll also let the radio antennas pop out. So at this point, the satellite can see and it can also talk. That's how it communicates with the ground. The satellite will slowly rotate, uh, aligned to the Earth's magnetic field, and as it turns, the Earth will go in and out of the field of view of those three cameras. 
how is it going to relate itself to the Earth's magnetic field? It's still a pretty small package. It doesn't look like it has thrusters on it or well, that's anything. That's right. It's actually a very simple answer. There's magnets inside. And those magnets are ordinary permanent magnets affixed to the rails of the satellite. And this is a technique that's been used many times with CubeSats that have already been launched. So we have a very high degree of confidence that this will work. So it's just like a big compass. It rotates itself, aligns with the magnetic field, and you'll know where the cameras are pointed and how the telescope, how the, telescope the satellite is oriented. Exactly. Uh, we can easily tell where we're looking on the Earth, which way the satellite is oriented by simply seeing what parts of the Earth appear in those pictures. All right. So give me a little detail now about how people are going to be able to receive broadcasts from this, what kind of broadcasts they can get, and how they might control it or take pictures. Sure. Well, the big picture is you, as a user of the satellite, will have a very familiar interface to this high-tech piece of gear. That interface, again, is your smartphone. Our smartphone app will allow you to send requests to the satellite to ask it to take a picture. Uh, it will allow you to send a message of your choosing up to the satellite. And that interface is our brand new satellite safari app. And we'll get into that in a minute. So with your app, and I assume this is an app which is going to be available for Android as well as the Apple devices? Yes. And that app is available now? Yes. Okay, we'll get to that. So with that app, I'm going to be able to take out my phone and communicate with the satellite. Well, there is an in-between step, which is worth mentioning. Okay. Your phone radio is not powerful enough to transmit to orbit. So we developed an agreement with the United States Navy, which has built its own network of large satellite radio dishes to talk to its own CubeSats to allow us to use their network to talk to SkyCube. So your iPhone will transmit a request to the Navy. The Navy uploads it to the satellite. The next time that satellite goes over Cambridge or California or China or wherever you want in that picture, the satellite takes it, sends it back to the Navy, and they send it back to your phone. Will people be able to look at any of this in real time streaming? Could I just kind of log on as a lurker and see any images or material coming from the satellite? Short answer is not really. I mean, one issue is that, you know, the satellite isn't going to be over all places in the world at one time. I mean, we'll have to wait for it to do an orbit or two or three to get over the place that you've requested the picture of. And uh, we'll have to wait for another orbit or two or three for it to get over those Navy ground stations to send the images down. So we think that you'll be able to make a request and get your image back within about a day, more or less, of the time you requested it. So it won't be real time, it won't be real time video, but it will be, you know, within the same day. All right. How long is a satellite going to be in orbit for? It's a good question. Uh, the natural lifetime of this satellite would be about one and a half to two and a half years. However, we're doing something a little unique with this mission in that we're bringing the satellite down deliberately early uh, to avoid space debris. And we're doing that by packing on board the satellite a very large balloon. The balloon is actually packed into the upper half of the CubeSat frame here. And when we're ready to, to come down, we give it a signal from the ground. Uh, the satellite inflates the balloon with a four gram CO2 cartridge, and the same kind of cartridge you'd find in a seltzer charger or a bike tire inflator. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the vacuum of space, that four grams of CO2 would expand indefinitely. So we can actually inflate quite a large balloon, actually a seven foot diameter balloon. Mm -hmm. So after we're inflated, this satellite is no longer 10 centimeters in diameter, it's seven feet across. All right, so the balloon is going to act, what, just to drag the satellite down? Yes. In other words, it's going to prevent, or it's going to have enough drag that the orbit is going to start to decay rapidly. Yes, in fact, once that balloon's inflated, our orbital lifetime decreases from two and a half years to about 12 days. So we have a very rapid re-entry after that point. And in that 12 days, there's one other kind of cool side effect that happens, which is that, well, this balloon, sorry, this satellite is no longer 10 centimeters across, it's seven feet across. And that balloon is big and bright and reflective, so you will be able to see your satellite crossing the sky with your naked eyes uh, as a second magnitude star crossing across the sky. And I'm, I'm going to jump ahead here, but I'm guessing that your satellite app, you're going to be able to track know when this is going overhead and you'd be able to take a look at that. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, the experience we want to convey is, you know, not just that this is something that's really out there and distant and maybe those guys are faking those pictures. No, there's the real satellite. I just saw it with my own eyeballs. That's kind of a wow moment for, you know, kids, teachers, you know, people all across the country, in fact, all across the world who have sponsored and funded this project. All right, now you mentioned the pictures that people are going to be able to do, but in the very beginning you mentioned tweets too. Can you tell me a little bit more about the tweets? Sure. Well, the tweets actually evolved from beaconing pings, which the satellite has brought, required to broadcast every 10 seconds anyways. In other words, every 10 seconds the satellite just has to ping out a signal saying, hey, I'm alive, still I'm here, here, still alive, right, exactly. This is so people 
a, a, well, so, so NORAD can knows track that the thing is alive, right? Well, we realized that instead of just sending out a dumb I'm alive message, why don't we send our sponsors messages? Why don't we send your messages? So you give us a message that we upload to the satellite through the Navy, and over the course of a day, it sends out those messages. It turns out that the, the maximum number of bytes that we can send at any one of these messages is about 120 bytes. That's about a tweet. It tweets 140 bytes. We've got tweets from space. Hey, that's pretty cool. You know, people <laughs> like that. Great. So uh, that's another part of this mission, is it's allowing you or, or anyone else out there with a smartphone uh, to be able to broadcast your own personalized message from orbit. And you're going to be sending those every 10 seconds or so? Yes, that's exactly right. All right, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. I imagine there's people that are watching this video going, well, wait a minute, how am I going to be able to do this? Can you give me a quick rundown of, of how people can get further information, find out what all the details, the real details of being able to do this? I presume that you have stuff on your website? Sure, yes. In fact, the URL that you want to go to to find out more about this project, it's easy to remember. It's skycube.org. The name of the satellite is skycube. Skycube, one word, S-K-Y-C-U-B-E dot right. org. Dot org, that's and exactly got, right. And it explains how all people can do sponsorships, yes. how they can, all right, that's yes. great. All right, so you were talking a little bit more about the deorbit mode, people being able to see this. I'm wondering, are you going to know accurately enough when the re-entry will happen, or will that sort of be like at a last minute you know, when will you find out exactly well, when the burn I might mean, happen? I mean, to be fair, NASA doesn't even know exactly when its satellites are going to re-enter. I mean, yeah. they can probably, we can probably tell within an orbit or two, but a lot of it depends on the atmosphere, which is variable. Or, you know, just how is that balloon oriented? Exactly how did it catch the air? I mean, these are things that, you know, we're not going to know ahead of time. And frankly, it would be really cool if we would have a fairly large network of observers throughout the world, you know, with a nice satellite observing app to give them some idea of where and when to look. And with the satellite app, it will be updated so quickly that as the orbit deteriorates, they'll still have an accurate position, so you'll act roughly know when it's going overhead within a couple of minutes, probably? Certainly, yes. I mean, oh, right is, now we can do that with our, our current satellite app. That is really cool. Thank you. All right, so can you tell me a little bit more about the satellite safari app? Sure. The details of it. So I'm going to put the satellite down and give you guys a quick tour of our satellite safari app, which we're running here both on an iPad and a Google Nexus Android tablet. So the app is already available for uh, more than one platform. So I'll start out on the iPad here, and this is showing our basic sky view. This just gives you an idea of what satellites happen to be overhead uh, right now in the sky. Uh, our animation controls let us flow the time forward. So as time goes by, you can see satellites rising and setting over the horizon. Um, the app will tell you where to look for them, but more importantly, it'll tell you more about them and also when you can see them. So the satellite we're looking at now is the International Space Station. And you get all sorts of you know, pictures, history, descriptions, um, but you also get a list of times when it will be available to see. Um, this is listing all of the passes of the space station, including the ones that are both visible uh, during the nighttime and not visible during the daytime. All right. Now, I presume, being the Apple device, it knows where you are, so it automatically will tell you for passes. Can you also set it for another location further in time? In other words, if you know you're going to be, uh, let's say, at another location uh, tomorrow night, you want sure. to see if there's anything available, can you do that? Sure, yes you can. The, um, the app has settings which, which, which let you set your location anywhere on Earth. And you know, there's one other really kind of fun thing that you can do with this app, which is that you can set yourself on the satellite itself. Really? Yep. This is satellite view. This is the view from the space station um, at this particular date and time, uh, April 28th. And again, you can run the time forward to see the sort of the astronaut's eye view of uh, what's visible from the space station right now. And you know, this is not just fun and pretty. Um, you know, remember, think of the future when we'll have SkyCube up in orbit. You might be able to use this app to do some of your own orbital photography planning to get an idea of what your satellite can see at a particular time. Is that accurate sky in the background that would be seen from this view? Yes, um, that is a real, true, correct, geographically correct model of the Earth. And um, it's all, the math is all done uh, using the same math that NASA uses to compute the positions of its satellites. So can you do this for more satellites than just the space station? Oh, sure, absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, it works for any of them. Sure. Um, in fact, Satellite Safari concludes um, many, many different categories of satellites. You know, everything that's been newly launched in the last 30 days, um, all of the visual satellites, which you can easily see, I mean, they're all in here. Um, you'll notice that some of these entries are in dark, some of them are in white text. The highlighted white text entries are the ones that are above the ground right now. Um, this one happens to be a, a rocket body that was uh, 
launched a couple of years ago to launch a Russian a, a Cosmos satellite. Yeah. So again, we can show it in the sky. We can say center. And that's where it is in the sky right now. We can zoom. It's, it's just you know above the horizon. Uh, this line is the satellite's orbit. So I can slow things down here a bit. And that is the satellite moving through the sky in more or less real time. Now, do you need to have an active internet or uh, 3G connection to have this work? No, you can take this out in the field and use it, say, at a dark sky site. Uh, in fact, we even have a night vision mode, uh, which will turn the screen red and let you, you know, preserve your night vision as you're observing these things. Um, the only time you might need an internet connection would be when you're downloading new orbits for the satellites. Um, these things move around a lot. I mean, they have rocket thrusters. They, they deliberately change their orbits. They, there's atmospheric effects. So, does the need app, to be updated. Yeah, the app will try to suck in new orbital elements once every day. And um, even if you have elements which are even up to a week or so out of date, you'll still get reasonably accurate uh, results. So you've got the satellite view looking back at Earth. There are other views that are available with this? Sure. Well, there's also an orbit view which shows the orbit of your selected satellite over the Earth. And I'm, I'm going to guess here that all of the little green dots are satellites, and of course the one you've selected you've got the orbit track for. Sure. In fact, you can just tap on any of these green dots to find out what they are and show the orbit at the same time. So, you know, we can run the time forward here as well and get kind of a fun view of how these things are actually moving in space over the Earth. Wow, that's really cool. Now, I know there's an awful lot of satellites up there, and I mean, if you had all of them, you probably wouldn't even be able to see the Earth. How do you select what you want to look at? Sure, there's a, definitely an ability to select different groups of satellites in our settings. We'll just go to satellites shown, and then you know these are all the lists of different kinds of satellites you can show. We can turn them all on if you want to do that. I'll just hit select all here, and there they are. Um, obviously, we have to zoom out a bit to see them all, but now we've got our geosynchronous TV and radio communication satellites over the Earth's equator. Um, we've also got a lot of military satellites, uh, weather satellites. Just, you know, there's actually something approaching 1,500 or 2,000 active satellites in the database. Wow, so these are all the geosyncs. You can just see them in their orbit. That's sure. really cool. Sure, and we've also got this sort of NASA mission control view, which shows the orbit of the satellite wrapped around the Earth. Uh, around the satellite, that circle is the visibility circle. Uh, if you're standing inside that circle, you can see Orbcom FM29. If you're on the Earth, you can, within that area, you'll be able to see that satellite in the sky. Exactly, exactly. And you know, we can sort of drag the map oh. around here. Wow, this is cool. Wait a minute, you can actually move yourself so where you're looking down on the Earth? Sure, sure. You know, this is the same math that we use to generate spherical views of the sky. We just applied it to a flat map of the Earth. We're all used to seeing maps of the Earth that are centered, you know, on the equator at the meridian, but there's no reason you couldn't say center, you know, North Africa or center Antarctica. It's and the same obviously map. the day-night line, so you can tell and sure. where you are at the moment. Sure, exactly. So it's all stuff that's fallen out of our uh, Sky Safari mobile app code base, and it lets us, you know, give you this code for a, a lot of app for a very good price. Well, speaking of cost, so how much does this cost? So. We're on sale on the iTunes store and on Google Play for $4.99. Really? Yes. That's a lot of software for five bucks. Well, we had a lot of software to start from, so uh, that's how we can get away with this. That is really cool. Well, thanks, Dennis. Really appreciate it. All right, Tim. Well, listen, once again, I want to thank you very much for telling me all about this stuff. But remind me again, if people want to get involved with this and learn more, they can turn to your website, which is? Sure, the website for the SkyCube project is skycube.org. Skycube.org. Right, and if you go there today, you'll find the Kickstarter project, which funded the development of the satellite hardware. So all that information is there, and people can get involved with the Kickstarter, be able to send their own tweets and look at their own pictures. Right, the site lays out the different packages of images and tweets that people can buy. You know, for $1, you get one tweet, for $6, dollars you get a picture. At the opposite end of the spectrum, if you want to spend $6,000, we will fly you to Florida for the launch, all right? And so while that Kickstarter campaign is successfully closed, by the time this video airs, we will be offering those same packages through skycube.org as well. So skycube.org is the answer. That's excellent. Listen, thank you very, very much, and good luck with everything. Sure. Thanks, Dennis. All right. I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine here at the 2013 Northeast Astronomy Forum in Suffern, New York.